Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Today's uh, Armed Forces of the Republic of China. And my guest is Dr. Alexander Huang, uh, who is chairman of the Council on Strategic and Wargaming Studies and also professor at Danjiang University. Moreover, Dr. Wang writes a column for a very leading Taiwan newspaper called the United Daily News. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you, Alexander. I'm glad you could uh, be with us today. I know you just got back from the U.S. and you're still a little tired and a little jet lagging, so thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Great, great. Well, uh, let's sort of get right into it. Um, Tsai Ing-wen has a very different approach to the military than the, than the Ma ying -jil. Could you describe a little bit of that uh, difference to us uh, for the benefit of our viewers? The difference is, uh, to put it in a simple way, is uh, can time and heart they are spent with the uniform services. Uh, President Ma ying make people, or especially the uniform services, believe that he took it for granted because it's a KMT president. Uh, the uh, the uh, part the army had always been, uh, 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 you know, part of the uh, establishment of a long KMT rule. So, um, you know, people in the military feel that Ma Zhou did not pay enough time and attention to the military need and believe that Taiwan's security is based on a sound mainland policy rather than a strong armed forces. Mm -hmm. uh, Tsai Ing-wen tried to change that and uh, had visited uh, barracks, air bases, uh, naval bases more, much more frequently than uh, President Ma ying -jou, and uh, had spoken to their heart uh, and to their need. So it is widely considered that Tsai Ing-wen had uh, worked very hard to win the support of the armed forces. That's my impression, too. Um, you know, it seems to me, um, not to sound too critical, but there seems to be a morale problem in the um, Republic of China armed forces. And she seems to realize that and seems to want to address it. Uh, uh, do I have something there? Yeah, I, I think uh, if we talk about morale problem, there are probably three causes. The first one, is the growing uh, imbalance across the Taiwan Strait that the China has become uh, pretty strong, uh, and uh, that's a, a, a the mounting threat is one of them uh, that have a psychological impact. Second is that for mo almost twenty years Taiwan did not have a notable uh, defense budget increase, so the military felt that they have been you know uh, you know underpaid or under. Uh, that they, they compares to other country to man and equip uh, the forces. And the third one uh, is more recently, it did not uh, appear before, that was the pension reform that President Tsai Ing-wen now is taking on. Uh, the pension reform will probably reduce about 15 to 30 percent of the possible monthly pension that they are currently get. Of course, there is a pension crisis, but that also had an impact. That's very interesting. It will reduce the level of their current pension. So if you're already a retired um, uh, ROC uh, military officer or enlisted or whatever, and you're getting, I, I don't know, whatever amount it is, that's going to be reduced by up to 30 percent. Yes, because of, uh, you know, it's a complicated calculation system. Uh, like every other country, but, mm -hmm. but to put it in a simple way, that the pension system of all military, uh, government service, and uh, uh, ordinary workers, all pension systems are approaching bankruptcy in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, previous presidents uh, did not want to take on this issue. I think uh, President Tsai Ing-wen is brave enough to touch on it, but as I said, it had negative impact. Uh, it has not concluded how uh, it's going to be reduced, but it's on the way. 
I, I, I agree with what you're saying. This is really a problem that should have been addressed by the Guomindan when it was in power, but they kind of kicked the can down the road and kicked it into her lap. And I, I give her credit for taking on this really difficult issue, because as you're suggesting, if something is not done, and then, then the pension fund is going to go broke and everybody's going to lose out. It's, it's just a shame to me that at the same time she's trying to build up the morale of the military, she's coming out with a pension reform, and I've noticed uh, in the Taipei Times as of late, there's been some pretty big demonstrations uh, carried out by former military people opposing what she's trying to do. Mm -hmm. There are others uh, from police, from firefighters and uh, high school teachers, because the pension reform is a reform across the board. Uh, and so it generated a huge protest uh, in Taiwan, but but the president seems to me is determined uh, to carry on. Uh, good for her. Now, you know, typically it's said that the social stability, the political stability of Taiwan depends on the soldiers, the bureaucrats, and the teachers. Is that changing? Is that is that sort of a uh, a changing phenomenon of Taiwan politics? Uh, um, it's too early to say, but it does have an uh, impact. Um, I do not want to think of or allege that this pension reform will change their loyalty to the country. But uh, there are growing pains in the household of those careers or, or professions because their previous calculation of family development, buying a house and everything else, or giving fund for kids to study in the United States. All their plan needs to be readjusted. You know, um, it, it seems to me another factor that probably uh, touches on this morale issue in the military is, my impression is from having been in the military, I talked to a lot of military people, military people like modern new weapons. They really, you know, uh, get off on that. And mm -hmm. it seems that, like what the U.S. sells to Taiwan is usually a, at least a generation behind the times. And, mm -hmm. you know, on the other hand, when Taiwan got the Apaches from the U.S., and the, and the type of Apache they got was really cutting edge. I think yes. the U.S. was the only other country that had it. I, I saw a swelling of pride in the, in the Taiwan military, and they wanted to show it off and bring all their relatives to test it out, or go on test flights and stuff like that, which they shouldn't have done. But I think it showed, you know, like a sense of pride that, that this kind of welled up. And um, mm -hmm. I, I think you agree with what I'm saying. And, and, and now with the Trump administration, it seems like, okay, the Obama administration was going to sell a weapons package to Taiwan mm -hmm. just before Obama left. And then that somebody in the, in the National Security Council um, upended that. And then Trump said he was going to, uh, you know, maybe supplement that weapons package and, you know, sell it to Taiwan. And now that seems to be on deep freeze because Trump thinks he's super buddies with Xi Jinping. Um, but I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Have you have, do you have any, like, uh, recent news about this weapons package, whether it's going to go through or not? Or what's your take? Yeah, the, the package that you refer to uh, is a package that uh, President Barack Obama uh, did not feel that he should sign it off and send the notification to the Congress right before his presidential term ends. So he left the decision for the next administration. To my knowledge, uh, uh, President Trump's White House uh, are looking at the package that we were talking about. Uh, but there are uh, different views. You know, some people said that uh, that this is a, a kind of package or request uh, from the past administration from Taiwan. The DPP may wanted to save money and pull all the resources together and uh, to to introduce a new package that that you know would more uh, close to what DPP's mind to a kind of force that they want to have. Right now, the problem is that whether the White House or the so-called the uh, mid and upper level officials in the state and in the Pentagon, 
are not in place. So, so there is no initiative or momentum right now. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, a slow appointments may also delay uh, the conversation between Taiwan and the United States on new arms sales. Um, you know, another facet about uh, Tsai Ing-wen's approach to military affairs is she really wants to build a national defense industry. And uh, as yes. I see it, it's for a couple reasons. It reduced Taiwan dependence on foreign sales. And also, um, as I see it, her, her, her thinking is if you have a national defense industry, it'll have technological spin-off that can go into the civilian economy. Um, well, how is she doing on that? What's your take? Uh, how, how do you, what kind of grade do you give her for building the national defense industry? The uh, determination and will uh, are very strong uh, on the part of presidential office and the National Security Council. Uh, they believe that, as you said, that a, a renewed emphasis of the uh, defense industry will bring more job opportunities and uh, technical beneficials to the uh, to Taiwan's economy. But everybody knows that this will be a long-term deal. It's not something that you can see that happening or the benefit can be seen in two years. So that's uh, one part. The other part is that whether Taiwan is in need of immediate upgrade of some obsolete systems to replace them. Um, if we are talking about a long-term strategy or industrial strategy, everybody clap hands and say, fine, we'll do it. And uh, maybe eventually uh, the United States will face difficulty to sell systems to Taiwan. So we need to build up some kind of our capacity. But on the other hand, the military is saying that we, we are flying really obsolete airplanes. Uh, for instance, our, our trainer, uh, our F-5s, right. they're, they're more than 40 years old. Uh, and so uh, a, a quicker supply would be, you know, buying from aboard. Uh, but this uh, would conflict, conflict to the president's uh, industrial plan. You know, that's uh, as much as I admire her 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 zest in wanting to create a national defense industry. I I, I have the concern that you just touched on is those trainers. Now, Italy makes some really good trainers, which are used by the Israelis yes. and several other countries. And you know, it's really hard to find com uh, countries that will sell any kind of weapon system to Taiwan. So why? Why not go through with this? Because like you say, it's going to take a while to develop this national defense industry. You need the planes now. Go for them. And, and yeah. there's another part of this, too, that sticks in my mind. And I remember you and I talking about it when I visited you one day in Taiwan, is um, Taiwan and uh, Raytheon in Italy are developing this uh, prototype uh, Taiwan minesweeper. Uh, mm. in, in, a, in an Italian port. And so the Italians are willing to, you know, yeah, sort of like, well, okay, whatever China says, so what? Uh, we're going to go ahead and do this. And not many countries do that. And, and you know, I, I don't think you want to hurt that connection. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, but with limited resources and, uh, and the current government's uh, vision on uh, how to use the limited resources, I think they, they consider uh, the building up or, or, or getting a stronger base uh, for the future defense industry as one of their highlights uh, uh, of their, their presidency. So they, they need to push over for it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I think this is a good place here to go to break. Uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Dr. Alexander Huang, who's joining us from his office in Taipei, Taiwan. We're having a really interesting discussion about the Taiwan defense issues. And Alexander Huang is a noted expert in this field, so we're really lucky to have him with us here today. Uh, we'll be back in about one minute, so don't go away. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't listen.
I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is today's um, Taiwan military. Our guest is Dr. Alexander Wong, who's uh, joining us via Skype from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, we're having a really good discussion about um, con very contemporary issues uh, in, in the Taiwan military. Um, well, okay, I think the next thing we probably should talk about, and some people will point it out to us that we didn't talk about it unless we do talk about it, and that's this uh, Taiwan submarine construction plan. What's your, what's your view on that? Um, several points. Number one. I know that you're uh -huh. a naval, former naval officer, so you must have a special interest in this. Uh, of course. Uh, I can testify <laughs> that in my conversation since I was in the 20s, now I'm almost 58, the Republic of China Navy had never gave up the, uh, the, the, the request, uh, the idea to acquire the underwater uh, fighting capability because it is strategic, it is stealth, and it is uh, uh, ne necessary for our aerial and uh, service uh, ASW capability training. Mm. So, so for us, the the uh, the submarine is more for ASW training purposes and the limited defense for coastal uh, waters. But it's not something fancy that we are going to use there to attack. Number two, the uh, the underwater technologies that we 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 do not have the blueprint. Uh, no country wanted to sell us. Uh, the blueprint or the uh, the complete submarine. Uh, President George W. Bush uh, show its goodwill and uh, committed that the United States will work hard to to see if Ta Taiwan can get eight uh, diesel power submarine uh, back in 2001. But unfortunately, uh, Taiwan did not uh, have the budget to go through. And there was a conflict in view within Taiwan politicians. Uh, so the Navy had be, uh, become the victim for this political consideration. Mm. You know, of course, uh, submarine is a, a sharp technology. Taiwan needs to buy, to purchase, to learn. It takes time. And uh, so right now, we, we are still in the stage of defining what kind of model capacity uh, and uh, initial stage of study. Uh, the current administration of DPP wanted to uh, conclude the study phase within several years and started the construction. But uh, everybody knows that we need money, lots of money, uh, to invest it in it, and we need to train our people, we need to invite and, uh, and pay uh, for a uh, foreign nationals with that, you know, knowledge and know-how to come to Taiwan to help us. It's going to be very hard. Do you think there's any possibility that Japanese might sell submarines to Taiwan or decommission the Japanese submarines? Um, it is uh, imaginable, but it needs lots of skill or probably one or two third parties uh, to get involved. Like the uh, US. To reduce the, the shock wave mm. uh, reaction from China. That's, that's a really good way to put it. That's a really good way to put it. And other parties to reduce the shock wave. You know, these days there seems to be more visible uh, interaction between the uh, Taiwan Ministry of National Defense and the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, you're shaking your head in the affirmative, so I guess you agree with that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I I think uh, former chairman of AIT, uh, uh, you know, had uh, in public stated uh, that uh, the uh, United States military personnel 
uh, visited Taiwan, uh, you know, in average is about 2,000 men a year. So it's a, it's a very close tie from uh, the uh, exchange of uh, academy uh, cadets to the senior dialogue. Uh, I think we have a lot of exchanges, uh, and uh, we are very hopeful that since the passage of the fiscal year 2017 Defense uh, Authorization Act of the United States, uh, there will be uh, new uh, possibilities for flag officer visit to involve Taiwan military in the United States hosted military exercises, and uh, there are more exchanges and uh, collaborations can be imaginable. Yeah, that sounds good to me. That sounds real good to me. Well, you know, um, traditionally, um, Taiwan military has been considered to be deep blue. And, but I wonder, with younger folks uh, coming into the military, folks that have been, were born and raised in Taiwan, um, and as I understand it, more and more of these folks are getting promoted to flag level rank. Is the military mm -hmm. becoming less blue and, and maybe not green, but kind of turquoise, a little blue and a little green? Is there, is there really a transformation going on? Um, in general sense, a short answer is yes. The, there there uh, is a generation change. Uh, so does uh, to the uh, government agencies and uh, universities. Uh, it's across the board. Um, uh, I think uh, the current Taiwan Armed Forces, uh, if we are talking about in the past 20 years, they were taught, educated to be apolitical. Uh, the Kuomintang or the, the Blue Party had been, uh, you, know, you know, took away their uh, military units or organizations more than 20 years ago. So we are looking at a new Taiwan military forces who will defend the island, fight for the constitution, protect the people, but they, they try not to be political. They learn their lessons and they model from the United States. They pay their allegiance to the country. Okay, so in other words, in the old days, you had to, if you were a, a Taiwan military officer, and I, I, I suppose perhaps an NCO as well, you were sort of forced, heavily encouraged, to join the KMT. I, that, mm -hmm. That's gone. That's that's out. That no longer. Yeah, the, you know, you can be forced to join the uh, KMT or passively forced, because uh, you know, if we are talking about 30, 40 years ago, every military, young military officer knew that if they do not have a party membership. They got a promotion problem. But mm -hmm. now, today, this is, you know, you don't talk about party membership. Even you have it, you have to hide it because people hate to talk about political parties in, in, in the rank and files. Uh, this is a, a new apolitical miniature. Hmm, that's really good. Well, um, now we know that you, um, you know, are the chairman of the Council on Strategic and War Gaming Studies. So tell us a little yes. bit about your organization. Well, um, you know, I, I started to learn wargaming uh, when I was a grad student in the United States in the classrooms and later on play roles uh, together with uh, my American colleagues in the Army, uh, you know, War College over uh, Carol Barracks and, uh, and uh, other government agencies. Um, so I learned a lot. When I returned to Taiwan, when I moved back, I, I consider that Taiwan is, uh, war gaming for Taiwan was only military. And uh, so I introduced the political military war games, the seminar games, <clears throat> the national security level war games to this country. And uh, I, I could say that I am a pioneer. And in the past, uh, you know, 10 plus years, I have been able to, uh, invite senior government officials to join my game, and uh, we have been pretty successful so far. Well, how does this work? Now, when you when you do these exercises, where you have these senior government officials, and I, I suppose senior military officials as well, do you do like role plays? Is this some kind of computer simulation? Uh, how, how are you, how's a, uh, what would be a typical problem you would have them work on, and, and how would they go about working on it? 
you know, usually we we put people in different rooms, uh, you know, in a style or format of seminar game. Uh, we give out scenarios at the national security level, pretty senior level, uh, and take on issues such as, uh, you know, the impact of a possible a war uh, in the Korean Peninsula or a unintended incident uh, take place uh, near the Taiping Islands in the South China Sea and how Taiwan's you know national security apparatus need to react to those situations of course I try not to touch the military assault or or operational uh, war games because that's their job I mean the, the uniform services job I only do the national security, you know, the foreign policy, men on policy decision making process. The political side of it. The political, yes. Okay, that's really interesting. Well, um, you know, there's so many mainland missiles pointed at Taiwan, and everybody's statistics vary, but somewhere it's between 1,200 and 1,800. It depends on what newspaper or magazine you read. Right. But anyway, there are a lot of missiles pointed at Taiwan. Does Taiwan need a THAAD system such as has been just um, put in place in uh, South Korea? Um, yeah, it, there are conflicting arguments. For me, I don't think Taiwan needs uh, a, a sad system per se. Uh, if uh, I, And I also know that the PAC-3 uh, Patriot system is only point defense. If we want to have an area uh, defense uh, of missile defense system, we need to think of that or a, a ship-based system. Um, to me, probably as a Navy officer, probably um, as a uh, you know strategic calculation, I would rather put if we're gonna have a area defense system. I would rather put it on board ships. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's unfair to stop you at this point, but I've just been notified that our time is running out, and, and that's the, you know, the clock is never our friend. And uh, I really want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a great interview. And uh, I want to thank you uh, and our audience for joining us today. Uh, our next broadcast will be on June the 5th, uh, and uh, at that time we'll be joined by retired Navy Captain Kimo Fennell, who is, uh, was the Chief Naval Intelligence Officer at Pacific Fleet. We'll see you then.